Welcome back to Hysteria, the podcast for people who just want to go back to sleep. Mm, yes, Aaron, I, I am people. We have been clutching our emotional support pets for dear life since last week. We watched the first presidential debate between President Biden and former President Trump. Uh, to say it was a bad night for America is an understatement. We saw Donald Trump, convicted felon, rattling off lies like it's his job, because it actually is his only fucking job, and President Biden struggling to deliver any real coherent message that night, which was his, you know, one, one job. Biden's performance has shaken the Democratic Party and caused loud questions about his fitness to lead. Now, you and I are actually not interested in talking about President Biden. The conversation that has ignited since the debate uh, I think you and I both find troubling. Um, now, Aaron, you were at the Essence Festival in New Orleans over the 4th of July. Yeah. And it was the 30th anniversary of Essence, right? That's right. Of yeah. the festival. 30, 30 years of Essence in New Orleans. Uh, amazing uh, anniversary. Shout out to Essence and the Essence Festival. And you saw Vice President Kamala Harris speak. Yeah. And as someone who has interviewed the Vice President more than any other journalist... I have questions for you. Okay, let's do okay. it. Aaron, what was the vice president saying down at Essence? What was she doing? Give us the vibes, give us color. Yeah, so, okay, so uh, the vice president, uh, who actually has made a few stops at the Essence Festival, it's kind of an annual stop for her. Uh, she did it as a candidate, she's done it as vice president, and she was back, obviously, headed into this very consequential election year, specifically to talk to black women voters. This is one of the largest gatherings of black women in the country, uh, something like half a million people uh, attend Essence between the festival and the concerts that happen with the festival. So this is really kind of a, a captive audience of some of the most loyal and consistent members of, of the Democratic Party base. So she comes to Essence to really talk about uh, the stakes of 2024. She's touting, you know, the administration's record on things particularly relevant to black women, uh, whether that's maternal mortality right. or whether that's student loan debt forgiveness or whether that's, you know, the administration trying to get medical debt uh, kept off of people's credit reports, right? Like, these are all things that we know disproportionately impact black women. And so she's kind of uh, recounting that record to, to much applause from, from a very supportive crowd. And she's also prosecuting the case against Trump and really framing his candidacy, his potential return to the White House as a real threat to democracy. This is something that uh, really resonates with a lot of black women. This is this is something that animates a lot of black women voters. Uh, just just really the, the threat of Trump returning to the White House. Uh, black women overwhelmingly rejected Trump's uh, candidacy in 2016 and again in 2020. So, um, you know, she was in front of this crowd that's really very clearly with her. Uh, but she, you know, was projecting confidence. She was pretty on message, uh, spoke for about 40 minutes. Yeah, I, I think she was uh, pretty effective at, at really kind of energizing and, and mobilizing these voters four months out from the election. So since the debate, a lot of chit chat, a lot of chit chat. You can't turn on the television uh, without hearing someone's opinion on what should be happening with President Biden going into the convention. Yeah. And it's ignited a conversation around uh, Vice President Harris. Yeah. And, well, if not him, then her. Or if not him, then who? And it feels like the broader media apparatus has been quite dismissive of the Vice President's leadership. Yeah, I mean, Why? I think... <laughs> I think that if not her, if, if not him, then who was really kind of the initial conversation, right? right? So you right. see coming out of the debate, uh, Vice President Harris was was one of his staunchest and swiftest defenders, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really kind Literally of Literally that night. Case. Yes, th Thursday night, you know, she's making the case for why uh, Joe Biden was, was still the candidate, even, you know, while acknowledging that, that his debate performance was not great. Uh, you know, saying that that uh, you know the last three and a half years uh, he has built a record that 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 has earned him the uh, party's nomination, and 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 that you know he has a record that that goes up against Trump, and 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 that it it, it is a record that that she still feels like is a, is a winning record that they have built. So, uh, you know, in the days kind of since then. We've seen Harris finally kind of entering the conversation, but not really being discussed as the sitting vice president that she is, right? I mean, like, 
Uh, she is somebody who has been a partner to uh, President Biden. But you still have folks that are saying that they're not really convinced that she's ready to lead or they're not convinced that she's electable. You know, we got that good old question of electability, uh, you know, because we have a woman uh, in the conversation. But I mean, you know, but what is that based on? Is that based on vibes? I'm not really right. I'm not really sure. Right. Because I mean, you know, she does... who seems to be taking her pretty fucking serious. Donald Trump. He couldn't get his her name out of his mouth at his rally last night. Yeah. And he's already workshopping nicknames for her on True Social. Cacklin Kamala. Yeah. So it's funny because Donald Trump, what do Republicans know that either Democrats or broader media doesn't? Because Donald Trump seems to be taking the idea of Vice President Harris potentially being the top of the ticket seriously. Yeah. I mean, look, so did Nikki Haley, right? I mean, when right. she was running, she absolutely framed the stakes of, of, of the 2024 election as, you know, a vote for President Biden was basically a vote for a President Kamala Harris. And that right. was something that she was hoping could kind of um, spook Republican voters into, you know, sticking with or, or getting on board with a Republican ticket. So, yeah, I mean, I think that there are certainly Republicans that see uh, Vice President Harris as a formidable candidate, if not a threat, right? To, right. To their election prospects. And yet, uh, yet a lot of hand wringing about uh, whether Kamala Harris is the one to uh, get the job done. If, in fact, you know, uh, what ends up happening is that the presumptive nominee is, in fact, no longer presumptive. So back in 2023, you wrote the op-ed, quote, could Biden choose a new running mate in 2024? Some Democrats say he should. Black women say he'd better not. Can you talk a little bit about what you wrote back then? Because I think it's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> this is not a new conversation, right? I, I think uh, it, it's also one that's not going to go away. And why is that? Uh, you know, I was actually having another conversation when I was at Essence last weekend with Kimberly Crenshaw, who uh, gave us, you know, the, the uh, language for intersectionality and, and feminism. And, and so, you know, what she talked about was the idea that black women are soft targets, right? Like who defends black women when they are attacked? Uh, and, and so these narratives often go unchecked, uh, you know, without other black women actually speaking out uh, in support of that black woman. So she's black. She's a woman. These are two knocks on her leadership. Um, you know, and so I think that's kind of why we find ourselves in this moment. I think the other thing is, you know, she's a historic figure, but she's in a role that people have historically ignored. But I think that what we're seeing now is that it, it's a mistake to have ignored her leadership, given that the president has always been old. So like this was always a possibility. Yeah. How do you see black voters, particularly black women, responding to the post-debate fallout? Yeah, I mean, black women are having it, right? I mean, they, right. first of all, you know, I, I feel like, and I wrote this, you know, in 2020, black voters are among the most pragmatic voters, uh, you know, in politics. And, you know, with Joe Biden being the nominee, uh, you're not really seeing black voters, black elected officials really abandoning President Biden. And I think, you know, that they are pretty squarely focused. What they came out of the debate thinking, I mean, not that they're, you know, they're not blind either. They saw that Joe Biden didn't have a great performance uh, on debate night, but they also saw uh, what they feel like is, is uh, the threat of, of Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, black voters have overwhelmingly rejected Donald Trump. So, you know, I think they are still really kind of focused on um, what a Trump return to the White House would mean, uh, you know, for, for them in their daily lives. And yeah, I think I think that that is really still where a lot of them are, even even as they're kind of watching uh, where white Democrats are and, and this fight that they seem to be having over over the future of this ticket. So something you and I were talking about the other day is that when Barack Obama was president, it was President Obama, it was Vice President Biden. It was Obama, it was Biden. The conversation in the past week or so has been very President Biden, Biden, Kamala. Yeah. Aaron, why does everyone feel like they can just call the vice president, who is a proper grown ass adult, Kamala? Yeah, a whole ass vice president, right? Uh, second most powerful person in the country, and yet uh, referring to her by her first name. And look, this is, I mean, I actually posted about this on X because this is something that I've, I've noticed uh, for over time. I mean, it, yes, I mean, I think it's become more obvious in, in the last week as, as conversation about her has, has uh, been more and more frequent. But, but really, uh, it, it's 
kind of been an ongoing thing. And, and, you know, the benefit of the doubt in me says, okay, well, maybe this is a testament to, you know, voters' familiarity and comfort with her, right? Uh, you, know, you know, when she was running for president, she was introducing herself, you know, she was referring to herself as Kamala. It, it, it is a trick that, uh, you know, some politicians use to try to humanize themselves right. or, or make That's themselves... That's true. You know, you know, I, I, she, so I get that part. I get Kirsten that part. Kirsten Gillibrand, I think, did the same thing. I think I mean, she was Kirsten. Hillary. Like, Hillary. Yeah. I, mean, I, I hadn't thought about that. That's an interesting thing. So there point. is that, right? So there's, there's right. kind of, you know, like the, like, you know, the, there's a, maybe a familiarity that people have kind of like, you know, Drew Barrymore in that, you know, interview that happened. Oh, that Mamala? That sure. Was, exactly. That was something. Uh, the, you know, that little couch moment that they, that they had, but <laughs> yeah, let's never forget, uh, never forget <laughs> that. But then there's a cynical journalist in me, right? That sees something else like this sign of disrespect for Harris and for the office. And, you know, at this point, it's just become so casual that folks don't even notice or care. But I would say that it matters. Maybe it's a Southerner or me. I don't know. But like, it but just don't you feel like here's here's where I see the distinction with the difference is if you were uh, if she was down at Essence. Right. And the women were yelling Kamala, Kamala. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who she wanted to break the barrier down with. Sure. Right. If you go back to the if you go back to the campaign or anything like that. Not cable news. Right. Like to me, that is the difference. Like when we would be out campaigning with Barack Obama, loads of people would yell Barack, Barack, Barack. Like totally fine. They want to feel close okay. to him. Get that. But when you put on your tie and you get in front of the camera and you're talking about the vice president of the United States and you're a professional, to me, it feels like you have manners and you say that part. Vice President Harris. That's what I'm saying. I feel right? the, the Southerner in me, something is not sitting right about you addressing this person. Like, I mean, she's a vice president. She's not your family member. She's not one of your little friends. Like, right. you know, it, it, it is Vice President Kamala Harris. That's what we're saying here. Vice President Kamala Harris. To anyone posting or talking, we're just saying that's the proper way. Aaron, Trump's trying to do some jiggery pokery, okay? He's trying to... Oh, one of my favorite phrases, yeah. He's trying to walk back Project 2025. It's like the more that people have caught on to it and Democrats started ringing the bell, he's trying to do like the Homer Simpson backing into the hedge, like <laughs> I had nothing to do with this. It's he is he is making it his point to be like, there's lots that I disagree with, but he's not saying what. Right. Project 2025, as a reminder to anyone listening, is a carefully thought out blueprint for the Trump presidency crafted by the Heritage Foundation and other conservative think tanks that pretty much destroys democracy as we know it. Trump has been taken to truth social, saying he knows nothing, Aaron, he knows nothing sure. about Project 2025 and has, quote, no idea who's behind it, even though former directors and advisors of his have been directly working on it. So we've talked about Project 2025. It continues the rights attack on abortion rights. Trump is trying to distance himself from that, too. The RNC has been making revisions. This has been some funny stuff to watch unfold. Uh, the RNC has been making revisions to its 2024 platform, shifting from a 20-week federal ban to a, quote, determined by the state stance. They all probably realize that being anti-abortion loses elections and pro-abortion activists across the states. Arkansas, Arizona, Nebraska, are receiving lots of support with their abortion ballot measures, but the full RNC membership has yet to vote to confirm the platform. So, Aaron, Trump's trying to look moderate. He's trying to be a little, like, a little moderate. He's like, this is, this is, I'm just a good guy, guys. I'm just here <laughs> for you. So what do you feel about Trump trying to distance himself from Project 2025? Yeah, it's, it's very Mariah Carey. I don't know her, right? <laughs> uh, Project 2025, I don't know her. It's not about how I feel, right? Like, it, it is about how voters will feel. And, and like, you know, you, you talked about Project 2025 and abortion. Like, this does feel like a sign that much like the abortion conversation, like he knows that this is something that a general election audience, these general election voters are not necessarily going to get on board with. So he needs to distance himself from this and, and, and kind of, yes, uh, try to make himself more palatable to uh, folks who are not necessarily at this point open to his candidacy. Right. So headed from essence to Milwaukee for the Republican national convention next week. I mean, wow, what a whiplash, what a, what a trajectory. Um, but that, that is, that is absolutely what's happening. Uh, I will be in Milwaukee and yeah, I think, I think that we will see, um, 
you know, th this, uh, the former president and the Republican Party trying to um, message to this, this broader American electorate that is not the same mm -hmm. as their base. So that message probably does need to sound different. And I think that that is kind of what some of this disavowing of Project 2025 is about, especially as more Democrats uh, and, and more voters, uh, just more Americans generally are starting to become more aware of, 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 of what this is. Do you think that this is just a campaign tactic that he'd reverse in office, or does he actually want to be slightly more moderate than far-right evangelicals? That's a good question. I mean, look, I, I, part of the reason that, that Trump remains popular is because he does deliver for his voters, right? But then he also does have, you know, advisors, people around him that have, uh, you know, their agendas, that, that, you know, and he is not necessarily out of step with those people either. So, you know, do they, what do they want? Do they want a federal ban? Do they think that that's something that's going to um, be okay to do with voters, despite the fact that we know where most of the American people are on, um, you know, a, a total federal ban? Do they think that this goes too far, right? We've seen the abortion issue come uh, back to bite them uh, in the two years since, since Dobbs. So, and, 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 you know, so I think, you know, it depends, you know, what you know, we know that he doesn't really have like an ideological, <laughs> you know, core. He's not so real tethered to anything. He's, he's, he's open, right? He's open. So, so I, I, I think that that is also part of the, the, the equation when, when folks are trying to make a decision about what to do in the next four months. Do you think, so the platform, it's leaking out in drips and drabs yeah. and it's being described in the media as moderate. Are people falling for the trick? Is it really moderate? You know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know uh, that people are falling for the trick. And quite frankly, I don't know just how much people are even paying attention right now. Right. I mean, cause so much of the focus has been on the debate fallout. Right. right and, and, right. and, you know, questions you know, continuing to, to surround Biden's fitness for office and, and, and what's going to happen with the future of the Democratic ticket. I mean, we just had a story on the 19th about the RNC approving that yeah. platform that would give right. rights to fetuses, endangering abortion, yeah. IVF. You know, this is something that, that, that um, Republicans will be weighing in on uh, at the Republican National Convention. And yet, you know, we're drinking out of the fire hose right now. So I just, you know, I just don't even know how much this is on people's radar. But, but I think with the convention... Uh, some of the stuff may come into greater focus next week. Are you prepared for next week? Like, can I just ask you, how are you girding yourself to go to Milwaukee? No, I mean, look, I'm actually um, really interested to see what happens in Milwaukee, right? Uh, I mean, I think, um, I think that we are going to hear more about Vice President Harris, yep. certainly, next week. So I'm listening to hear kind of how they talk about her. I'm, I'm interested to hear what, if anything, they will be, if, if they want to kind of continue the culture war, especially around transgender folks uh, and their rights, like if that is something that they see as an issue that they want to take into the general. Uh, and, 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 you know, what will be the role of women? <laughs> you know, right. you, who's going to get platformed? I and mean, we still don't even know who his VP is. You know, could that potentially be a, a woman or, or, or who is that going to be if it is not? Can I give you my woman? prediction? Oh, See, I'm, I'm here for the prediction. You're a proper reporter, so I'm not asking you for your prediction. Um, speaking of women, you heard it here first. If I am Trump, given what's happening in the Democratic Party right now, I 100% am picking Katie Britt. Oh, wow. I am, We're bringing her back. I'm bringing Katie Britt back. Here's why. Because if Trump in 2016 could have picked the perfect running mate, it would have been fucking Ivanka. I mean, if we're being honest, like mm. she appealed to people he does not appeal to. Right. And so Katie Britt is like a U.S. Senator, but also like a TikTok trad wife and is also actually a, she's smart like I know that we don't take that away from her like we don't take that away from like what we saw that's not that was rather to say that is that was not our takeaway this is interesting what you're saying because I mean this is this is actually making me think of Sarah Palin's debut right 100 John, Mc, John McCain picked Sarah Palin her debut on that stage I mean that uh, there were a lot of Democrats that watched her debut and thought oh we maybe have a problem, right? Yes. Yeah, and you were there. <laughs> I was there. And she, she's like Sarah Palin, 
but smarter and problematic, like problematic, but in very different ways. Mm. And if I'm Trump and I'm uh, on trial, uh, people think I'm a predator. You know, people worry that I'm a sex pest. And I bring out Katie Britt and I'm like, here she is. Because she's got trad wife vibes, she's not going to try to upstage him. She's not going to try to be better. Now, she doesn't have Todd Bergham's money. It's one thing. But if you want someone who's going to be dutiful, who's not stupid, who will do well in a debate, in theory, I think, I just, if I'm Trump, and and also I think it's really funny that in the past week, um, there have been like these leaks that Donald Trump doesn't like facial hair. <laughs> So that's apparently like a ding against um, J.D. Vance. Well, I was going to say, I mean, she's got that going for her if, if, if that's part of the criteria. Listen, so TikTok has now given us trad wives and Caesar salad. The, the girl loves It's informing the conversation. Dinner. We're yeah. in the conversations informed. So look, do I think he's really going to pick Katie Britt? No. But if I were him, if I were him, that's who I would pick. Stranger things. Who knows?